In this set of mini lectures, we're going to be talking about tissue culture. Now, tissue culture can also be called micropropagation. I'm going to use them pretty interchangeably for the purposes of these lectures. However, we will talk a little bit about when you might use one term over another. So, what is tissue culture? Well, tissue culture or micropropagation is defined as the development of new plants in an artificial medium under aseptic conditions from very small portions of plants. Now usually we use the term micropropagation if we're doing this sheerly for the purpose of propagation. In some cases we will use this as a stepping stone to do other things to plants which we'll talk about a little bit more later and that's when you hear the term tissue culture more frequently used. Now another term that also means the same thing, um, if you do much research into journal articles on this topic, you may see references to in vitro propagation. This is also still just tissue culture or micropropagation. In vitro literally translated means in the glass, so we're propagating plants in a glass jar or sometimes a plastic one, but hey, let's not get too nitpicky on that. Now, Tissue culture is the one type of propagation that we're going to talk about this semester that can be sexual or asexual. Everything else that we've talked to up to this point has been asexual. So cuttings, layering, bulb propagation, grafting, all of those are asexual propagation techniques. However, tissue culture is sexual or asexual depending on what kind of plant material you put into that artificial medium. If you use any vegetative part of the plant, then it's asexual. If you put seeds into tissue culture, then it's sexual. So that's the difference. One last point here, the term aseptic. This is a very important component of tissue culture. Aseptic means sterile. You have to have plants growing in a sterile medium in sterile conditions for this to work. So in the picture here, we have a plant growing in a flask. That flask would, of course, have to be sealed for this to be successful. So why does it work? Essentially, we can take any piece of a plant, put it into tissue culture, and get a whole new plant from it. We've talked about a concept that makes this possible before. Do you remember what it is? Totipotency. Remember that word? Remember, totipotency means that every plant cell contains the entire genetic code necessary to produce an entire new plant. So that means in theory, each plant cell could produce a whole new plant just from that single cell. So if I take a piece of a leaf, such as these leaf sections in the picture, and put them in tissue culture, any of those cells have all the genetic code that we need to make new plants. So we only need a small piece of leaf or a small piece of root. Even a small piece of flower petal will often work for tissue culture. Why do we do it? After all, it's a pretty high-tech form of propagation. It requires a lot of special equipment, which we'll talk about later, so why go to the trouble? The first reason is it allows us to rapidly produce lots of plants, rapid mass production. So a good example for rapid mass production are orchids. All of your traditional methods for propagating orchids are pretty slow, and they don't produce that many plants very quickly. You're pretty much limited to division of some sort or other with orchids. And so for a long time, orchids were plants that were only owned by very wealthy people because the longer it takes to propagate it, and it can be a difficult plant to grow in the first place, then the more it costs to produce, which means the more they'll have to sell it for. However, now you can get orchids at Lowe's for like $15. So why can we do this? Tissue culture. Orchids that you see at garden centers are pretty much all propagated by micropropagation. And so because of this, we're able to produce very large numbers of orchids very quickly. Now tissue culture can also be used for pathogen control. Because you're growing sterile plant pieces in a sterile environment, this allows us to grow essentially disease-free plants. You can even grow virus-free plants using tissue culture, and this is what they do for crops that have a lot of virus problems, such as strawberries. Strawberries could very easily be propagated by layering since they naturally layer themselves, but they are prone to a lot of viruses. So what is used commercially is virus-free plants that growers buy fresh each year. And so the way they make those virus-free plants 
They take a meristem, an actively growing and dividing part from the strawberry plant, place it in tissue culture, and grow new plants from that. Since the meristem is actively growing and dividing so quickly, it won't have caught any viruses yet, and then we move it to that sterile, aseptic environment of tissue culture and we can get virus-free plants. And then finally, tissue culture allows us to have year-round scheduling for plant propagation. You'll recall that with cuttings, certain species can only be propagated successfully from stem cuttings at certain times of year, particularly if it's a woody plant. Some can only be propagated by softwood cuttings or semi-hardwood or hardwood. With something like grafting, again, you have to think about, do I have to graft this when there's good bark slippage? So time of year can be limiting. But tissue culture, which takes place indoors in a controlled environment, can be done year-round. So it allows you to be more productive with your propagation operation. You can do this even during the downtimes when you can't do other types of propagation. So here's an example for the whole idea of rapid mass production using micropropagation. The plant pictured here is called maiden grass, and the scientific name is Miscanthus sinensis. It's a popular landscape plant, and it's very easy to tissue culture. For my in-person class for horticulture majors, they often tissue culture Miscanthus grass because it's very easy. Now here's an example. I had a student start with four shoots initially of Miscanthus grass in a jar like the one shown here in tissue culture. After only five weeks, it had produced 24 shoots total in that jar. So the picture there, that's probably about 24 shoots in that jar. So that gives us a multiplication rate of six if we do certain calculations. And then if we do further calculations, which I will share with you if you really want to know them, but I did not put it on the slide, so you'll just have to email me. The rest of you can take it on faith. But using this method, you can get almost 332,000 new miscanthus plants in only 20 weeks using tissue culture. So that's a lot. The only other way to propagate miscanthus grass is by seed or division. Seed we don't want to do because it's not going to give us genetically identical offspring and if we're selling this at our nursery we really do care about uniformity. Um, so that leaves us with division. Division requires much more parent material. You need an actual big clump of grass, not as big as the bottom picture there. That's just to show you what the plant looks like at its adult size. But you're going to need something a lot bigger than what you can fit in that tiny tissue culture jar for a division. And you're going to yield way fewer plants. In 20 weeks using division, you're probably only going to get a matter of hundreds of plants rather than thousands. So you see it really is a very drastic difference in regard to the amount of plants you can get in a short period of time using micropropagation versus other methods of propagation. So that sounds pretty good. Why don't we tissue culture everything? Well, there's some disadvantages too. For starters, it takes pretty expensive facilities, and I'm going to go through here in a couple slides exactly what you need to do tissue culture, but it can get very expensive. It requires more skill. Anytime you're doing work that requires a sterile environment, that's a whole technique that you have to learn. It's very, very easy to contaminate these tissue culture growth environments, whether it's a jar like you've been seeing in the pictures or a petri dish, which we also use at times. Even just the slightest brush of something non-sterile on the edge of that jar can cause contamination, and that's what you see in the picture here. That contamination will grow very quickly. It's going to either be bacteria or fungi. Fungi grows incredibly fast. But even bacteria grows faster than the plant. That piece of plant tissue is the slowest growing thing in that jar. So if you have contaminants such as bacteria or fungi, they're going to grow much faster, deplete all the resources that are in the media so quickly that the plant just stands no chance and it dies. So when we say errors can be multiplied to large numbers quickly, just the slightest error in your sterile technique can contaminate a whole lot of plant material and then you can lose it quite quickly and all the work that you put into to get it in that jar in the first place. The final disadvantage you see listed there, reversion to juvenile form, 
Remember that one of the advantages of asexual propagation is that you can sometimes skip that juvenile stage for woody plants. So if you're growing something like an apple where you want fruits or you're growing a plant where flowers are very important, you want to propagate from mature tissue and hopefully you'll get a mature plant faster, such as an apple tree that will grow apples in the next growing season rather than taking seven to eight years as it would from seed because it has to pass through that juvenile form. Well, sometimes just the environmental conditions present in a micropropagation setting causes that plant tissue to revert to the juvenile form. So now we lose our benefit of bypassing juvenility if this is asexual propagation, and if it's a fruiting plant, that's a problem because that means we have to wait again for fruit to form. It won't happen in the next growing season or two. So I said it was expensive. What exactly do you need? Well, to start with, you need a room that is dust and draft free. You can see why this is not a good technique for home. Do you have a room in your home that is dust and draft free? I do not. If you do, I applaud you. The second thing you need is called a laminar flow hood. And this is what you can see in the picture. That is graduate school me, working hard. And that counter area is actually something called a laminar flow hood. It is enclosed on every side except for the one I'm sitting at, so it's like an open box. And the way it works is that it actually sucks in air through the bottom. That air goes through two sets of filters, a regular air filter like is in your home, and then a HEPA filter to remove fungal spores and things of that nature. And then that sterile filtered air blows out of the back panel of the hood across the work surface, creating a sterile environment for you to work in. Laminar flow hoods can cost anywhere from five to $15,000. So that's your biggest expense right there. You also have to have growth chambers or culture rooms. This is essentially just somewhere to put your petri dishes or your jars full of tissue cultured plants. And this is gonna require you to have the basics, temperature control, light racks, the sort of things actually that you would have already to grow plants maybe from cuttings or seed in your house. So you do have to have that area though. You need an autoclave, this is another big expense. The autoclave sterilizes. It's like a giant pressure cooker. It's actually what they use at hospitals to sterilize surgical instruments. And so the autoclave, you're gonna use it to sterilize the media, to sterilize your jars, to sterilize your tools. Everything has to be sterilized by the autoclave. And then finally, you need various instruments, containers, etc., for tissue culture, like the jars or the petri dishes to put your plants in. You're going to cut up your plant pieces typically using forceps and scalpels, so you'll need those. And if you look in this picture, right next to my head is sort of a cylindrical looking device. That is a, another sterilizing tool. This is for your forceps and scalpels. Now, already everything should be sterile in that laminar flow hood environment, but because we're being very careful, I would put plant pieces on a petri dish or a couple of petri dishes, and then I would sterilize my tools in between just to make sure they didn't get contaminated. And the way I would do it is by inserting them into that cylinder. It's a superheated environment, and basically it just cooks any contaminants right off those forceps and scalpels, and then I let them cool a little bit before continuing to use them to cut up plant tissue and put it on the petri dishes. You don't have to have one of those, that's pretty fancy. You can just use a small alcohol lamp or a Bunsen burner. Basically an open flame is what you would need. And here's me in the culture room. So they had a pretty big culture room set up. This is at the research station near Asheville, North Carolina, where I did my graduate research. And so all of those racks are full of tissue cultured plants of all different types. Some of them are in jars, some of them are in petri dishes, but thousands of plants in a fairly small room. And here's the lab as a whole. So that man juggling in the middle is the tissue culture master at the research station, Dr. Darren Touchell. The rest of the people you see are technicians and graduate students. So they have two laminar flow hoods. Here you can see the laminar flow hood on the left side of the picture from the side so you can see how it's enclosed. A smaller hood there behind Darren. To the left of Darren, there's the doorway back into the 
chemical lab where we wash the glassware, keep the autoclave and chemicals. And then to the right of Darren, there's the doorway into the culture room where they keep all of the cultures after the plants have been placed in tissue culture. So what exactly are we growing these plants on? You've seen lots of pictures now of plant parts growing in jars and petri dishes on this sort of gel-like substance. What is that? Well, that's our tissue culture media. Just like your cuttings are in some sort of soil-like media with peat or perlite, just like your air layers were packed with peat or your bulbs were put in perlite or vermiculite or whatever you used, this is just a different type of media. Now, all the media that I have shown you so far in this mini lecture has been agar media. Agar is what gives it that sort of jello-like consistency. However, you can also use liquid media, and people who do tissue culture for their sole occupation have very strong opinions about which is better. If you use a liquid media, that means that your plant pieces are suspended in a liquid, and usually you have to store it on sort of a shaking platform that keeps it swirling continually so that things don't precipitate out of the media, and just to keep the plant pieces sort of suspended in the media. Now, Dr. Tuchel, who I showed you a few slides back, was an agar media guy. So that's what I used, and that's what we use in in-person classes here on campus. So the media contains the agar, which gives it its gel-like consistency. It contains minerals, and these are just the same kind of minerals that would be in a fertilizer that you put on a regular plant. So nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, things like that. Carbohydrates, which in this case simply just means sugar. There is sugar in there vitamins, and growth regulators or plant hormones. So these are all the things in a typical tissue culture media, and this is what happens. If you look at the picture, you'll see these sort of dark brown centers and then those sort of lightish green yellow spindly things coming off them. The brown things are the original plant pieces. So these were originally small squares of leaf and they were green, and then all their energy was used to produce these new plantlets Often you do this in the dark, that's why they're this sort of yellowish white color. Once we get a lot of shoots, because that's what those spindly things are, they're new shoots, we'll move it into the light, let them green up, and then eventually they will form roots as well. And you can see that in this single petri dish we have maybe even 50 to 60 new shoots, all of which will become a new plant if handled properly. So that's what you're looking at, and that's what's in that media. So typically we mix all those ingredients together as a liquid, we autoclave it to sterilize it, it becomes very hot, and then you pour it out into your dishes or your jars and let it cool, and then it gels up and then it's ready to have your plant material added. Let's talk about the growth regulators a little more though. Growth regulator and plant hormone are another set of those interchangeable phrases. People use them interchangeably, although technically, you're supposed to say plant hormone when you're talking about one that is naturally produced by the plant and growth regulator if we're talking about a synthetic one. For example, you know that on your stem cuttings and some of your leaf cuttings you used auxin. Auxin is a plant hormone. Plants naturally produce IAA and a little bit of IBA as auxins. So that's a plant hormone. Auxin is also a plant growth regulator. There is synthetic auxin, and that's what you used on your stem cuttings, that could be in the form of IBA, NAA, etc. All of these things listed here, and we would call it a growth regulator. Now that said, people use them pretty interchangeably, but I just wanted you to be aware. So very small concentrations of auxin are added to that tissue culture media, and what that's going to do is stimulate the production of roots and callus in whatever plant tissue you put in the jar. There are different forms of auxin. Again, we've already discussed IAA, IBA, and probably NAA when we talked about cuttings. 2,4-D is actually an herbicide, but in tissue culture you use it in such very, very small concentrations that instead of killing the plant tissue, it stimulates root formation. So it is an auxin. The other growth regulator we use is called cytokinin, and this helps produce shoots. So auxin produce roots, Cytokinin produces shoots, and just as you have different forms of auxin like IAA and IBA, 
We have different forms of cytokinin, such as kinetin, BA, 2IP, zeatin, things like that. So here in this picture you see these are actually the same kind of plants I showed you on the last slide, they're just farther along. So those spindly whitish yellow shoots were moved onto a new media, they have brought into the light to make them green, and so they've produced a lot more shoots and they will produce roots soon as well. So where do we get this plant material that we put in tissue culture? Well, you can use a wide range of plant species. There's really not much limit as to what you can tissue culture. It's just that not everything has been. Everything about tissue culture is species and sometimes even cultivar specific. That means for each species of plant, there's a particular plant part that works best for tissue culture for your starting material. There's a specific media recipe that works best and so there has to be a lot of research done to find a effective efficient tissue culture protocol for every species out there. So things like orchids they've pretty much got down. Woody plants tend to be a little more difficult to tissue culture so this is something that people are still constantly doing research on to find good micropropagation protocols for each species. Something like this Boston fern here and in fact, a lot of our commonly sold house plants are tissue cultured and they have the protocols for those pretty much down. So you can micropropagate a wide range of plant species. You're pretty much just limited by the knowledge that we already have. Um, a wide range of plant parts. I did leaf tissue for my project, but for some plants you would do root tissue or stem tissue or petal tissue seeds, even pollen can be grown in tissue culture, so it depends on the plant. One thing that's pretty uniform, if you can, it's always better to use greenhouse grown plants, and that's because whatever parent plant you use, it's already going to have contaminants on it. There's just no avoiding it. It's going to have bacteria and fungal spores and who knows what else on it. However, if it's grown in a greenhouse, it's going to have less of that than if it was grown outside. In both cases, you have to do a sterilization procedure to the plant material, usually soaking it in 20% or 10% bleach or 70% ethanol. There's usually a whole protocol just for sterilizing the tissue. But if you start with a greenhouse grown plant, you're already starting out with something that's cleaner than a plant that's been grown outside. So with that, we're going to end this part of the mini lecture. In the next one, we'll go through the actual stages of a plant developing in tissue culture.